Let's discuss medications used to treat neuropathic pain. This is by no means exhaustive, but I want to give you a flavor of possible options for treating neuropathic pain. Once that's done, I'm going to share with you a supplement that we're using more of to help with neuropathic pain symptoms. This is just one snippet of an approach to manage neuropathic pain. There are other means of managing neuropathic pain, but here we're just discussing useful medications. One thing to understand about using medications to treat neuropathic pain is that sometimes medications can be used in combination. So for example, a sedative medication is combined with a non-sedative medication. It might be better to use two medications in lower doses than one medication in a higher dose. It really depends on the person that we see because there might be some medical conditions that may prevent us from using a certain medication. So it's not a set situation where if you've got neuropathic pain, you must use this medication because different people have different medical conditions, different people have different symptoms, different people have tried different medications. So it comes down to quite a bit of expertise and sometimes experience as well. There is a study that was published in 2019. It is still a good study. I'll put a link to the study below so that you can go and have a look at it yourself. But let's go through what we call three lines of therapy. First line, second line and third line therapy. First line therapy is exactly that. Use these medications, consider these medications early and first for neuropathic pain. The two big groups or the three big groups should I say are the gabapentinoids, the SNRIs and the tricyclics. The gabapentinoids involve pregabalin and gabapentin. There are some pros and cons for each of these medications. There are certainly some risks and adverse effects for each of these medications. Pregabalin, the dosing can be anything from 150 milligrams to 600 milligrams a day, but the effects might include tiredness, dizziness, peripheral edema, so swelling, weight gain, blurred vision, because it is aiming to suppress the nervous system, but unfortunately some of these medications can suppress the big nerve, the brain, the spinal cord, so you can get these symptoms occurring with gabapentinoids. Similarly with gabapentin, however, my experience, I use far more gabapentin and pregabalin because the side effects of gabapentin are much less than pregabalin and it's much better tolerated than pregabalin. And the dosing, you can start on a very small dose of gabapentin and that might be helpful and the dosing can be gradually increased over time if you tolerate the medication. Gabapentin has been studied in diabetic neuropathy, post neuralgia, and some cancer-related syndromes. Pregabalin, in a similar fashion, looked at diabetic neuropathy, post neuralgia, spinal cord injury, and some others. You start on small doses, and you gradually build up the dose over time. Pregabalin, you might start on 25 milligrams once or twice a day. Gabapentin, you might start on 100 milligrams once, twice, or three times a day. You need to take these medications for a sufficient length of time to work out if it's helping to work out if you're getting some side effects as well. Obviously, if side effects occur quickly, the medication will be stopped. You need to have consideration for lower doses in renal problems. The tricyclics are tried and tested. They have been around for many, many years. This includes anitriptyline. This includes nortriptyline, and I use a significant amount of nortriptyline. A lot of the people we see have got complex pain conditions. They've trialed amitriptyline. They get sluggish. They get tired. It can sometimes cause weight gain, dry mouth. Amitriptyline can cause what we call anticholinergic side effects, which is where it might affect glaucoma. It might affect bladder function. It might affect bowel function. In really high doses, amitriptyline has been known to cause cardiac arrhythmias and uh, cardiac problems. Any of these medications need to be started in a very small dose and the dose can be gradually up titrated. So 5 milligrams at night, 10 milligrams at night and gradually, gradually go up. Similarly, you need to take these medications for a sufficient length of time to see if it changes the pain or if you're getting side effects. There is a group of medications called the SNRIs, the serotonin noradrenaline reuptake inhibitors, that are very good medications for neuropathic pain. One of the benefits of the SNRIs is that they are generally not sedative. 
So they can be used in combination with the gabapentinoids or tricyclic medications. But like anything, they have side effects. Uh, medications include geloxetine, uh, venlafaxine, and desvenlafaxine. Start on a small dose, generally in the morning, and gradually the dose can go up. But it can cause nausea, stomach upset, bloating, constipation, similarly dry mouth, and in some people a little bit of lethargy and tiredness as well, although I found these effects not to be very common. Second line options include opioids, of which they've mentioned tramadol and tapentadol. Second line medications include topical agents, that means agents applied to the skin. So let's talk about the opioids, tramadol and tapentadol. Like anything, the doses need to be low, the doses need to go up slowly, the doses need to be balanced between benefits and side effects. Some patients don't tolerate these medications, some of these medications cause side effects. Some of these medications can be effective as well. Tramadol, the doses are 25 to 400 milligrams a day. Nausea, vomiting, constipation, lethargy, sometimes seizures, and sometimes what we call ataxia, difficulty in moving your body. Tapentadol has been used to treat as second line treatment for neuropathic pain conditions, so anything from 50 to 600 milligrams per day. Similarly, it can cause nausea, vomiting, constipation, lethargy, uh, seizures, and ataxia, pretty much similarly to, uh, to tramadol. Tapentadol is used a little more than tramadol nowadays. Um, it, has, uh, it can have some benefits. It's a mixed medication. In other words, it can, cause, it can affect some forms of neuropathic pain. It can, for, uh, it can be used to treat some forms of arthritic pain as well. Uh, but these medications need to be balanced out with potential risks, tolerance, dependence, dose escalation, side effects. It's a very tricky thing prescribing pain medications for some people because of the potential risks, because of the potential side effects, because every person sitting in front of us is different. And we've got to take into account cardiac systems, liver system, kidney system, and various other systems as well before we just uh, can prescribe some of these medications. Uh, topical agents can be useful in neuropathic pain. Lignocaine patches, if you've got a small area of uh, hypersensitivity, a lidocaine patch, a local anesthetic patch, can cause, uh, it can, firstly it can act as a barrier, and the second thing is that the lignocaine, what we call diffuses across the skin and numbs some of those hypersensitive nerve endings. But the patch itself can be tricky. It can cause irritation, it can cause dryness, it can cause redness, it can cause itch. Um, so that's a topical agent. Capsaicin can be used, and it's a very low dose. A capsicum is a, a capsaicin is an extract from the capsicum. So it's chilies, it's hot, it's it's painful. But interestingly, it can treat some forms of neuropathic pain. In Australia, we've only got low doses of capsaicin, whereas other parts of the world, they have 8% capsaicin, quite well studied in diabetic um, peripheral neuropathy, so what we call painful diabetic peripheral neuropathy. Capsaicin 8% can give you three or four months of pain control. I hope one day I get the chance to be able to use it in my practice. Um, Third line therapies for neuropathic pain include strong opioids. Now, some people may have quite um, strong views on the use of opioids and chronic pain. There are pros, there are cons. Um, opioids that are mentioned in this uh, recommendation are morphine and oxycodone. They have risks, they have side effects. It's quite hard to define whether these medications are useful in the long term. I've certainly seen many patients in my practice where these kinds of medications have done more bad than good. It's not to say that some people don't uh, find benefit with the use of opioids. They're a small group of people. The way these opioids need to be used, managed and supported must be quite tightly controlled. Um, let's discuss opioids at another time. I know that a lot of people out there will want to discuss opioids. Nevertheless, it has been defined as useful as third-line therapy in uh, some forms of neuropathic pain. Botox is also third-line therapy for neuropathic pain. Um, 
I use quite a lot of Botox in my practice for some forms of neuropathic pain. It's been studied in areas where there is hypersensitivity, so facial pain, and, uh, and doing little Botox injections in an area of pain and hypersensitivity can be quite helpful in reducing the symptoms. Interestingly, part of my practice has evolved, as one does with, with experience, to using Botox on some forms of peripheral nerves to provide a long-lasting neural suppression. Um, and I found this to be particularly helpful in some forms of uh, neuropathic pain. Now, you're not gonna put Botox on a nerve that controls motor function because if you paralyze the nerve with Botox, it's not gonna work. So Botox should only be used by experts, by people experienced with its use, and generally you're gonna use it on what we call a sensory nerve, not a motor nerve or a mixed nerve. But Botox is definitely there, it's definitely third line for neuropathic pain. This has by no means been an exhaustive uh, discussion on medications for neuropathic pain. There are many other medications we can use, there are infusions we can use, but that's for another discussion. As mentioned, I want to uh, give you some information on a supplement that we are increasingly using in the pain world to help support neuropathic pain or to help treat neuropathic pain. That chemical, uh, well, it's not really a chemical, it's a supplement, uh, it's a naturally occurring fatty acid. It is called pamatoyl ethanol amide, or P, as in P-E-A. Uh, that's sometimes what it's referred to as well. It has been around since the late 1950s. It is gradually gaining some scientific evidence for its use in neuropathic pain. It's sometimes referred to as an extended endocannabinoid medication. It is not a cannabinoid. It is not cannabis. It is very loosely related to that system of uh, receptors and chemicals within the body, but it is not a cannabis medication. It is a naturally occurring uh, free fatty acid or fat fatty acid amide. Um, it uh, has been shown to be useful in some forms of uh, neuropathic pain conditions and even some forms of musculoskeletal pain conditions and there have been some studies looking at it in uh, palliative care as well. I just want to mention some of the pain conditions that have been studied and just give you some doses uh, that may be useful to consider. It's been studied in spinal cord injury, it's been studied in uh, pelvic pain, some forms of pelvic pain, dysmenorrhea, uh, TMJ, uh, temporomandibular joint disorders, multiple sclerosis, burning mouth condition, uh, sorry, burning mouth syndrome, uh, very difficult to, to manage uh, facial pain condition, uh, diabetic neuropathic pain, uh, so PEA has been studied in diabetic peripheral um, uh, neuropathic pain, uh, it's also been studied in knee osteoarthritis as well, so there are some studies suggesting PEA can be helpful for some inflammatory conditions, some pain conditions, notably neuropathic pain conditions. Um, the dosing, it's, uh, the studies have suggested anything from 300 to 1200 milligrams per day. The studies generally suggest more than one dose, so uh, usually twice a day. In my practice, I suggest it uh, three times a day, so that's anything from 300 to 600 or 600 to 800 milligrams two or three times a day. You should take it for about two, uh, two to three months to really get a sense of whether it is helpful or not. But PEA for neuropathic pain, some inflammatory pain and mechanical pain can be a very useful supplement in the management of neuropathic pain conditions.